Thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this day. We thank you for the weekend just completed. Just pray that you help us use this time wisely, Lord, just to uh, understand as much as we can uh, the homework which was assigned is to uh, complete our thinking on L'Opital's rule, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, well, let's get to it. You guys have questions, I think. Thirty-five and eleven point four. <coughs> Excuse me. Now is that one assigned or is it just? Yeah. But I pretty much have to do that one because I <laughs> don't have a similar one, <laughs> right? I mean that's it is what it is. Now what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to state whether the sequence. Um, Converges, oh, this is section 11.4? Yeah. Actually, I can take this example and raise you a uh, similar example. I don't know. How about, um, oh, I'm, I'm trying to think of how they, uh, oh, here's how they probably want you to do it. I'll do it for cosine of x squared. I, I just thought of a, I mean, so that, that's a sub n, and you're supposed to analyze what, <coughs> whether it converges, basically to analyze the limit. I mean, so I look at this thing and I immediately go, oh, well, as n goes to infinity, the bounds converge both to zero. So intuition says to me, this thing is zero, right? So if I'm just asked to find this limit, that's enough. It's clear to me this thing converges to zero. However, if I want to give a justification for that, I guess what I might do, right, it's pretty simple. Remember this, this rule, guys? If I have, um, well, not a, if I have little m less than or equal to f of x, less than or equal to big M for A less than or equal to X less than or equal to B, then one of the properties of the definite integrals is, is, is as follows. M times B minus A less than or equal to the integral from A to B of F of X dx less than or equal to, oh, you notice I changed your, your sine to a cosine, I hope you don't mind. I, I changed the cosine to a, I've, yeah. It's not exactly the homework problem. E but it's very, very similar. Um, <laughs> so that, that property of definite integrals is definitely the one to go with here. See, because if I look at, what do I got? I've got minus one less than or equal to cosine, for example, of x squared less than or equal to one. And that's definitely true for, well, for any really, for any closed interval, but certainly this one. Right? So this then from that property of definite integrals gives me um, minus one over, well, see here, what's b minus a? Two over n, right? So I get minus two over n less than or equal to cosine of x squared less than or equal to two over n, right? for each n in the natural numbers. So then I can show that, I'm sorry, idiot, not you, me. Um, minus one over n to one over n, right? That was, that's the punchline of the theorem there. Hence by squeeze, right? I won't, I, I really hope I didn't see this in your solution anywhere. I definitely shouldn't write that. I mean, the dx is, is, uh, is needed in here. <coughs> We're not so 
freewheeling and carefree that we can not write the DX in here. <laughs> okay. When you leave this course, you can stop writing the DX if you want, just not in my courses. Hee hee hee. All right. Um, that. Yeah. Again, if I'm just asked to find it, you know, I can just look at it and go, well, look at what happens to the bounds as n goes to infinity. They're both going to zero. What's the integral over a point? You know, by definition, essentially, that's zero. Next question. Of course, this isn't really a L'Hopital question, right? This is a number what? Of what section? I'm sorry? I, I just couldn't hear you. Oh, OK. 41? Oh, well, I, I'd really like to get questions about L'Hopital's rule today. So here you're asked to find the perimeter of a n-sided polygon. So what you do is just basically work it out, you know? Draw yourself a picture, think about, you know, this is side R. Um, if you think about this, right, something like this picture, I mean, you can draw it for a couple, just, what's the angle? here. It's 2 pi divided by what? How many sectors are there? n, right? So 2 pi over n gives me the angle that. And then all you have to do, right, is figure out this problem. You've got a triangle, basically, right? You can split it in half. Then this angle is theta over 2. The hypotenuse length is r, so all you got to do is figure out what's this length, right? That's trigonometry. I'll leave it to you. Once you do that, n times l sub n would give you the perimeter, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, I need to set it up in terms of n. So you have to imagine dividing it into n equal sectors, right? So if the sectors are identical, which is the case for a regular polygon, it must be that the angle subtended in each sector is 2 pi over n. Because you have 2 pi total angle all the way around. And if you're dividing it into n pieces, 2 pi over n is the angle in each triangle. Yeah, n is the number of sides. That's what, that's what the problem says. It says, suppose a regular polygon of n sides is inscribed in a circle of radius r. Uh, has perimeter blah. Oh, oh man, they tell you it has perimeter r. I think you're, so oh, show, show, it's a show that. So showing that basically amounts to working through the trigonometry. If I do much more, I'm going to show it. That I don't want to do more. I want you to work through the trigonometry. Why would the angles have to be different? It's a regular polygon, so each sector in it would be the same angle, interior angle. Oh, regular polygon means all the sides are equal. That word regular means, oh, oh no. Oh, oh, you're trying to do for a regular polygon. Oh, that's much harder. No, 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 no. No, stop that. Do not try that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. Regular is important. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. 
You guys are very brave. You always try to solve problems that are like way harder than the ones that are assigned to you. It's, it's interesting. It's the most unfortunate on tests, right? After you make an error, it doesn't usually make it. I mean, let's face it. The subset of functions which are easy to integrate is small, right? So if you make an error and you get off track from the track I put you on, it's not usually helpful, <laughs> right? It's not hard to change a problem which is rather simple to one that's <laughs> unpleasant. Anyway, next question. Ten from eleven point six. Sure. Um, here we have x times the sine of pi over x. And I'm guessing x is going to what? <coughs> is it infinity or okay? There is really no way to um, get up to speed on these except to work a bunch of problems. I've assigned you a minimal set. You should work those and work some more probably if you really want to get the kind of confidence that you need to really succeed you know, at a test in here. You, know, you, you want to get past the point of stumbling through them. By the time you're done with the homework on L'Hopital's rule, you want to be bored with it is, is kind of my point. In the good sense of bored, not like at the start. But <laughs> hopefully not. What's the trouble here? As x goes to infinity, what, pi over x goes to what? Zero, right? So we've got sine of zero, which is zero. Um, so x goes to infinity. So this is type infinity times zero, right? So that means it's indeterminate. What we're going to do here is to rewrite it by putting the x downstairs because reciprocating sine doesn't really do anything nice for me. But if I do, if I reciprocate, if I put x downstairs by algebra here, then that's nice because then I'm looking at like the, the numerator and the denominator, both depending on 1 over x. And that, that kind of pattern is nice because when you apply L'Hopital's rule, what that means is the chain rule is going to generate the same kind of terms, both upstairs and downstairs, and they'll cancel. That is a generically something you're looking for. If you can get both the top and the bottom to be functions of the same function, then when you apply L'Hopital's rule, supposing it, it applies, nice things will happen, like, like this. So what happens? I apply L'Hopital's rule to what type? Now it's type 0 over 0, right, after the algebra step. And I hope I'm not losing you. x is equal to 1 over 1 over x, right? This is the fun fact I'm referring you to from algebra. And this gives me what? Limit as x goes to infinity of cosine of pi over x times minus pi over x squared, right? Divided by minus 1 over x squared. Well, that's nice because the 1 over x squareds cancel upstairs and downstairs, right? And we're just left with the limit as x goes to infinity of minus, oh, the minuses cancel even, right? So I got myself a pi cosine of pi over x. But by continuity of cosine, this is the same as pi cosine of the limit as x goes to infinity of pi over x, which is pi cosine of 0, which is pi because cosine of 0 is 1. And sine of 0 is 0. I would again refer you to the manifest reality in front of you that I did not pick up a calculator to check these things. And it should be the same for you. Sorry, is a sermon I'm preaching this week. <clears throat> Other questions? Is that clear enough? Or? Yeah. I 
I can't integrate cosine x squared. That's not known. It's not an elementary integral. Well, if I instead had um, like something with a manageable integrand, right? Suppose I had something like a sub n integral minus 1 over n to 1 over n. <coughs> Excuse me. Easiest way to make it integral is just to write it as the derivative of something, right? <laughs> right, then that would be. But then by continuity, I mean, if f is differentiable, we're assuming, that implies it's continuous um, near 0. And as n goes to infinity, you get f of 0 minus f of 0 using the continuity of f and the sequential. So you're right. I mean, if we knew an antiderivative, we could use that sequential composite rule paired with the fundamental theorem of calculus to solve this. But the point of this is not to do that, because we don't know the integral. That's why they made it sine of x squared. If you found an integral of sine of x squared, sorry, but you're wrong. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, if you found a sine of integral of sine of x squared, in about three weeks from now, I'd be like, good for you, but that's still not the right way to look at this problem. We will actually find a way to find a quote unquote integral of that function using series. Not too long from now. Anyway, I digress. So other questions? While you're thinking of your other questions, let me work, a, work an example here from 11.4. I claimed that we would come back and do these with L'Hopital's rule. Now it seems like an appropriate time. The one was number five. Number five of section 11.4. OK, what was that? It was this claim. The claim was that ln of n over n goes to 0, all right? So consider the limit as x goes to infinity, all right, of the natural log of x over x. This is type what? Infinity over infinity, right? So I can apply L'Hopital's rule here. And I get 1 over x divided by 1, which, by the way, is just the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x, right? So that's 0. But f of x equals to ln of x over x um, is continuous. on 1 to infinity, and f of n is equal to ln of n over n for n in the natural numbers. Thus, um, by the continuous extension theorem, we have that the limit as n goes to infinity of ln of n over n is equal to 0. I do get tired of writing all this. Ugh. There is a there is another common notation for this notion I probably should share with you. Would you be too upset with me if I shared you a shorter way to express the same idea? I don't think you would. So here's another way you can get away with saying these things. But it, it in, I mean the, the concept here is the same, but the notation's a little bit different. So basically here's the idea. Limit as n goes to infinity, um, ln of n over n, all right, is equal to, by L'Hopital's rule, infinity over infinity, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n divided by 1. And here I say extending n to 
be a continuous variable. This is how I usually teach it. I've been following your book and not saying this up to this point, but it weighs on me to not have this way of expressing myself. And so, I mean, the point is I'm still getting across the idea that I'm not applying L'Hopital's rule to the sequential limit. I'm, co I'm applying it to a corresponding limit of a continuous, thing, continuous variable. I'm just allowing myself the freedom to say that n is that continuous variable. So it's basically just saying n equals to x. There's, anyway, so, and of course that's zero. So if you'd like to use this terminology, you're free to, okay? But if you don't say extending n to be a continuous variable, then I, I really do have to take something off when you use L'Hopital's rule, given that's the kind of, you know, story we've been telling in here. I'd like you to tell the same story, basically. Oh, any other questions? I have one other example on 11.4 to do. Then I'll go back to your questions. The other interesting claim in 11.4, <coughs> there are my markers. And this is a really interesting one. Well, actually, there's two. Wait a minute, no. Five. Oh. Six is less interesting. I'll come back to that at some point. Um, so here we have one plus. I guess he. I'm debating whether or not he uses the previous result to prove this one. Anyway, I don't care. I'm going to do it directly. So <laughs> 1 over x plus 1 over x plus n to the n-fold power. All right. The limit, I'll use limiting notation here. The limit as n goes to infinity of this is equal to e to the x. This is 7, uh, section 11.4. But I'm going to prove it using different methods. I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule <coughs> to prove this. OK, so what we're faced with here is an indeterminate power, right? So if you look at the thing inside the nth power, right, the base here, 1 plus x over n, here x is a real number, OK? If you look at this, as n goes to infinity, what happens? That goes to 1, right? But on the outside, what does n do? Well, n goes to infinity, right? So this is like type 1 to the infinity. So how do we solve such limits? Use our usual attack, right? Remember I showed you last time, limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus x over n to the n power. What we do is we rewrite this as the limit as n goes to infinity of the exponential of the natural log of 1 plus x over n to the n-fold power, right? Then I use continuity of the exponential, right? And <coughs> the, um, the um, what's the word, properties of logarithms to get this, right? So that's really the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of n times the natural log of 1 plus x over n. Continuity of the exponential, and what else? Um, properties of log, properties of the natural log. You guys follow me so far? I hope so. This is our standard technique for dealing with indeterminate powers. I now I call this thing what? I call this thing star, right? And I attack that separately. So I'm going to call this, this, this animal right here star. Go deal with it down here. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity 
of n times the ln of 1 plus x over n. All right. This is just like the easier example I worked over here, right? It's number 5 of the same section, remember? Ln of x over x. Except what? Well, no, it's not like that. What is this? It's not quite like that. No, it's not like that at all. What's this like? Well, the x is not the same as that one. Here, x is fixed and, 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 and independent of n. I think it's kind of more like this example, right? The pattern. I've got an x times something with 1 over x, right? So to make L'Hopital's rule work nicely here, I bring n downstairs. Then I'll have both the top and the bottom being essentially functions of 1 over n. So then I know after I apply L'Hopital's rule, nice things will happen. So I've got natural log of 1 plus x over n divided by 1 over n. Now we apply L'Hopital's rule, right? So L'Hopital's rule, type what over what? What happens to the, the numerator? As, x, as n goes to infinity, x over n goes to 0. So we have the natural log of 1 plus 0, which is 0. And downstairs, of course, I have 0 as n goes to infinity. So this is type 0 over 0. So I can apply L'Hopital's rule. Remember, we need to check that. If, if it's not type 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, and you apply L'Hopital's rule, it's just pure unbridled nonsense. It will give you wrong answers. <laughs> So here we go, limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x over n times what? Minus x over n squared divided by minus 1 over n squared. What did I just do? At this point, it becomes very nice to have introduced the concepts of extend extending continuously. Right? In other words, I'm inventing some function of a continuous variable running L'Hopital's rule on the continuous function, and then observing that the same pattern has to hold for the original sequence which matches the set function. Of course, if I made the function a function of x, then I would be very confused here, because x has a wholly different meaning. I would have to do like f of t. But anyway, I think it's nice that we avoid that and just get straight to the, the point here, which is what? These cancel, almost. What do they leave you with? x, right? But then you can finish by limit laws. x is a constant here. It has no dependence on n. So this is exactly x over 1 plus 0, also known as x. So you go back up to here, right? And what's the conclusion? Therefore, limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus x over n to the n is equal to e to the x. You could take this, by the way, as a definition of e to the x if you wanted to. Some people do that. This formula naturally arises from the study of compound interest. If you like 1 plus um, the rate divided by the number of compounding periods or whatever. I, I forget the details. Money doesn't matter to me. You know. But <laughs> it is true that you can, you can motivate the exponential through the study of compound interest. And this is sort of the continuous extension of that notion.
thinking the number of compounding periods to infinity at the same time adju appropriately adjusting the rate down to smaller and smaller incremental rates. So, any questions? If you look at the arguments that are given in section 11.4, you'll see that they had to work a lot harder to get these results. That's because L'Hopital's rule is a beast, right? I mean, when you use L'Hopital's rule, you should think of yourself as being in beast mode or something like that. I don't know. It is, it is a non-trivial tool, this L'Hopital's rule, which I still have not proved or motivated for you. We've just been using it. Other questions? Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think the only way I can even scratch at that is to work the given problem. I don't, I can't, there's no <laughs> earthly way I can come up with some kind of similar problem. So what have you tried there, I guess I should ask you? <laughs> well, I think first things first, you should write down the problem, right? Like what you're asked to show and write down the hint and think about what it means to the problem, right? For sure we should do that. So let's just do that and see if it doesn't pop out at us what we should do. So we're asked to show, I mean, oh, goodness, if I write that much, I'm almost solve the problem. Oh well, okay, fine. Don't be scared by this problem. It's just, um, it's, it's trying to, uh, look, the point of 43 and the point of 44 is to introduce you to some formulas of Gauss. So like Gauss is, the famous story about Gauss is he was like a kindergartner and the teacher's trying to waste their time. Kinder, uh, teacher's like, add the numbers from Add up the numbers from one to, uh, what was it? One to 100 or something like that. And Gauss just like basically looks at him, goes five, what was it, 5,050 or whatever it is. He puts his slate down. They used to write on these little slates that, you know, like a sort of view. Some of you guys have whiteboards that you write on, do scratch work or whatever. Like think of that except for like a little chalkboard. That's what they did their schoolwork on. So Gauss knew this because <laughs> Gauss thought about numbers a lot. But he implicitly already knew this formula. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus da da da, da plus n is in fact 1 half n <coughs> times n plus 1. For example, if you take the sum of the numbers from 1 to 10, you get 1 half of 10 times 9. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't do math. Um, 10 times 11, <laughs> otherwise known as what? 55. Try it. 10 plus 9 is 19, plus 8 is 27, plus 7, 34, plus 6, 40, plus 5, 45, plus 4, 49, plus 3, 52, plus 2, 54, plus 1, 55. There you go. But in fact, that's true for any n. So that's how Gauss was able to just magically add the first n numbers without even really know, adding them. He just understood that that was the pattern. Now, most of us are not like that with numbers, right? <laughs> that's, most of us aren't the prince of 19th century mathematicians either, and that's fine. But this, um, thankfully, has been passed down to us, and now we know this. This is something we know, quote unquote, know. Now, I don't think you know that. I don't think any of us really, well, I guess if you're on a desert island and for somehow your uh, sustenance is based on your ability to know mathematical formulas, maybe then you'd know it. I don't know, something like that. But um, <coughs> so 1 plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus da 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 plus n squared is also something that there's a special formula. This is given to you in problem 44. You don't have to prove this, right? It's a hint. The sum of the first n squares is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. divided by 6. 
all right? But that, that's given to you. So the problem before, like 43, let me, let me work 43. If I work 43, you can do 44, actually. So, or let me do some version of 43. It could be something like this, the limit as n goes to infinity of, I don't know, um, 1 plus n plus, oh, sorry, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus da 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 plus n divided by, gee, I don't know, n squared plus 7. All you got to do is piggyback off Gauss. So you're like, oh, thank you, Mr. Gauss. I will trade that, these guys, for just what? One half n squared plus one half n. And then we're back to a rational sequence, which we, we own this problem already, right? It, it's, it just steps in your house. You can shoot it. You're not liable if you do. At least not in the state of Virginia. Let's see here. Actually, I don't know. I'm really not, not a lawyer. I can't speak to the uh, mathematical consequences of annihilating formulas in the state. I really don't know. Let's see here. One half would be the answer, though, to this hypothesis. So you, do you see how to do 44 now? Yeah. You just plug in that hint and go from there. You may not even need to multiply out the formula. You might be able to just divide the top and bottom by whatever it is. I mean, looking at it, the n the n uh, here's, my, here's my thought on number 44. It diverges because the top is cubic, but the bottom is quadratic. So I, I don't see that ending well, unless infinity is your goal, in which case it ends splendidly. So I don't know. I can't make these kinds of judgments about the good guy, bad guyness of a problem. I, I don't know. It's anyway. Oh, other questions? Hmm. These these exercises, 43 through 45, are like rather circuitous ways of introducing you to Gauss's formulas. Yeah. You may have seen those before when you studied Riemann integration to start with. Sometimes we come cover those when we start study like definite integrals the first time. Those, what you, those are what you actually need to just straight up calculate the Riemann sum for something like a parabola or something. If you know those Gauss formulas, you can just calculate the Riemann sums directly, which is, of course, the wrong way to do it. <laughs> but anyway. Other questions? All right, let's see here. We have till when? What is it? It's Monday. We have five more minutes. All right, perfect. Let me give you back your quiz. I will post a solution shortly. John? Yeah, I'll just, I won't say last names. Thomas? Brian, Jordan, Sean, Sean, no, no Sean, Taylor, Devin, oh man, I got his notebook. Any of you guys know Devin? Yeah, phooey. Cameron Rummel? Oh, sorry. Your, your identity has been made known to you too. Now you may be famous like me. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Braden. Charles. Otherwise known as Chuck. Let's see, Sarah. No. Oh, man. No, Sarah. Jake. Seth. Mr. Tran, I think I have some other homeworks of yours. Come see me after class about those. Will Colley, oh, sorry, slipped up there. 
Evan. Francisco. Oh, there you are. I didn't even see you slip in. Tyler Martin. Sean. Back to Sean. Okay. All right, so let me just... Um, Oh, apparently I'll prove the mean value theorem tomorrow. The, I mean, Cauchy's mean value theorem, which in some sense justifies L'Hopital's rule. We'll, we'll probably go over that tomorrow. It is um, <clears throat> not that complicated, really, just kind of a simple application of Rolle's theorem to the appropriate formula. So it won't, it won't take us more than probably about 10 minutes to go through that particular proof. It's not the whole proof of L'Hopital's. Like, L'Hopital's is more general than that. But we'll prove L'Hopital's in a special case probably tomorrow at the start of class. So let me just say this. Um, I won't talk about the calculus one. If you got that wrong, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Number, the, the, the definition. What is the definition? Okay, so one of the things you guys are getting confused about, and understandably so, there's a difference between stating a definition and using a definition. All right? The statement of the definition is something like this. If for each epsilon greater than 0, there exists, let's say, k in the natural numbers such that n greater than or equal to k implies the absolute value of a sub n minus l is less than epsilon, then a sub n goes to l. All right. Now, I probably worded it differently when I, when I said it before, but this is, there you go, that, that is a concise um, statement of the definition of a limit, right? This is not how it actually appears when we prove things, though, right? When we prove things, we're trying to verify that this statement's true for something, right? So when we prove something using this theorem, how does it go? Almost, and certainly we should start with something like let epsilon be greater than zero, right? and choose um, k equals to blah, yeah, da, 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 I mean, and so forth and so on. And then we say, you know, assume n is greater than or equal to, you know, k, and consider, then we look at a sub n minus l, and then we say less than stuff, less than epsilon. Hence, a sub n goes to L. See the difference? I mean, there's using the theorem is different. I mean, using the definition, affirming the definition's truth for a given example is different than just stating the definition. Right? So some of you are getting caught in the semantical difference between these two things. That's, that's easily fixed. Now, very, very few people in here had this definition correct like completely correct. A lot of you have traded there exists for and. That's just simply not the logical structure here. We have to do it for an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero, and we have to find a choice of k for each such thing, you know, that implies this, this inequality. And I certainly can't put an and here, like the implication is an important part of the, the logic here. So. I mean, there, you can change this a little bit, but not too much. And certainly imprecise words like and in the place of implies won't, won't work in here. Okay? So I'm just trying to give you guys a heads up about that. Then um, problem three, some of you have the right answer, um, but very, very few of you have what I would say is correct justifying work. Um, so I won't, we're probably out of time at this point, so I'll let you look at the solution. But the, basically the point is, you need to explain what you're doing more carefully. Uh, a bigger systematic problem is some of you have floating expressions, right? And I think I more or less turned a blind eye to a lot of that on the first test because, um, well, there was enough else going on there. I didn't want to pick at you about that. But here it starts to become an issue. What's connected to what? Where there should be an equals, there should be an equals, right? Implies is different than equals, and you can't just trade one for the other to try to gloss over what it is you don't understand. I will call you on that, and I won't let it go, right? So I try to say things precisely in here. I expect you to do the same. I know in your previous math classes, a lot of what the professor has said on the board has been like just to try to like 
get you to understand the bigger idea and you're not actually responsible for writing those things down, that's less true in here. I actually do expect you to write something similar to this, for example, if this was the problem. Or, you know, wherever, or, or this, you know? So what I tend to write on boards, for examples, is, is more close to the model of what you should be trying to write for the solution to a problem. In the case I say justify, right? If I say find, that's a different ball game. If I had just said find, many of you I wouldn't have taken, I wouldn't have even thought about taking off points. This quiz is just out of five. Don't try to figure out where you lost points. It's graded as a whole. You know, there's the high score in this quiz is 4.5. I'm sure you guys, uh, don't worry about losing quiz points either, by the way. You need to understand where you are wrong, and that's the purpose of quiz is to try to let you know where that happened sooner rather than later so that you do better on the test. I think these will make you do better on the test. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. It has in the past semesters anyway. Thanks, guys.